Today, this hero has returned to the Capitol a final time. Throughout his life of service, President Bush personified grace. His character, his character was second to none. His example will always inspire, and his lifetime of service will be enshrined in the hearts of the American people forever. Two. Welcome back to Harbaugh. The country continues to mourn today as we remember a fallen leader. Of course, President George Herbert Walker Bush now lying in state right now in the U.S. Capitol a few blocks from here. Within this hour, the public will be welcome to join in that and get in line. I think I'll be there tomorrow morning. The 41st president made one last trip back to Washington on Air Force One today, renamed Special Air Mission 41 in his honor. Bush's service to the country, he loved, spent a lifetime. Of course, look at this list, a Navy pilot during World War II. Shot down a couple times by the Japanese. U.S. Congressman from Texas, envoy to China, CIA director, vice president, of course, president. In his one term as president, he had a lasting impact both domestically and abroad, of course, passing landmark legislation, including the Americans with Disability Act, the Clean Air Act, and getting the breakup of the Soviet Union. That was pretty big. We also served as a restrained commander in chief in the Gulf War more than can be said for another member of his family. At the end of the week, he will return to Texas, where he will be buried alongside uh, Barbara Bush and his daughter, Robin, who passed away at the age of just three due to leukemia. That was a tragic point in their family's lives. For more on the life of George H.W., I'm joined right now by Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today, John Meacham, of course, one of the great presidential historians of our time and author of Destiny and Power, The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush, a great book. And Eugene Robinson, columnist for The Washington Post. You're also wise. I have to start with you, John, because I loved your book, especially uh, I didn't I wasn't as thrilled by his progeny as I was by him. But there are people in that new class of Bushes which are very impressive. Not the ones you would think of. People like Marvin, I think, are great people. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's a significant family. Some have chosen politics. Some have chosen. They all serve in in, in some capacity. Uh, And I think they do it because the reverence they have for their dad is an ambient reality. Uh, I like to say that if if my kids end up having 10% of the affection for me, that the Bush children have for George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush, I'll be way ahead of the game. What's the difference between uh, Joseph Kennedy and how he influenced his kids and a George Herbert Walker Bush? This is a big divide, so explain. Such a great question. I think this is something you think about a lot, too, and written about. I think to some extent it's the immigrant story versus the patrician story. Um, The Bushes were not New Englanders. They were from, the Walkers were from St. Louis, the Bushes from Columbus, Ohio. But S.P. Bush, who was Senator Prescott Bush's father, was the sort of the guy at Buckeye Steel for the Harriman found uh, fortune. Uh, they came east pretty quickly. Uh, Prescott Bush, like his son, was kind of entrepreneurial. He ended up being one of a big investment banker. But I think the Kennedys had an ambition that burned even more brightly. The Bushes, I think, felt more comfortable that they had been born to some extent to lead. I think the Kennedys were trying to break into a world dominated by people like the Bushes. Yeah. Gene, your thoughts? Um, he was um, uh, the last of a kind, I think, mm-hmm. in, in a way, at, at least in terms of our, our presidents. He did have that noblesse oblige. He came from from that class, from that family. Uh, and he had the, um, the uh, he was the last, I think, of the period when um, bipartisanship was a real thing. It was it was different from the you know pre Bush and post Bush. I think um, there were very different things. He was um, uh, it, it was the time when people really did have friendships and relationships uh, and common interests across the aisle, uh, and and when um, party didn't mean what it means now. Uh, I, and I think he was, a, in a sense, a transitional figure for the Republican Party. Well, three best you know, he, he, I mean, he came in and, and he was what we would call a moderate Republican, or not at all a Republican right now, no. actually, given yeah, today's no. Republican Party. But his three, um, three best friends, right, were because Chris was working with him, were Democrats in the House. Mm-hmm. Ludd Ashley of Ohio, Sonny Montgomery of Mississippi, mm-hmm. and Rosti. Yeah, who were all Democrats. Yeah. All in different circumstances. Even when Rosti went to prison for the mm-hmm. stuff he did, and he did do it, uh, Bush stuck with him. 
as a friend. Yeah, because that's who he was, right? Yeah. He especially stuck with him when he was was in trouble. That's when you especially need your... Uh, Let's your, talk about personal relationships, yeah. not just the, some of the schmaltzy stuff, which is all true. I noticed that he was always really good at, at nurturing relationships for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Like he was working Mubarak years before Mubarak became president of Egypt, sitting at baseball games, autographing baseballs right. with him up at, up at Orioles Park. And then when these people... It was not a dance learned learn for the occasion, that he knew as part of his life and growing up was getting to know certain people that he would be able to influence at some point when it mattered. You know, that's that's so true, and it's so true during his presidency and his vice presidency, and actually when he was at the UN as well, where he took a long view in building relationships with other foreign leaders or people who were going to be foreign leaders right. in other countries. He told uh, his, his staff he didn't want the first call that he made to a foreign leader to be a situation where he had to ask for a favor or where there was a crisis. Teach that to he every wanted, young person in America he, right now. Wanted, Don't make the first call when you want something. Right. Right. Make a call. Make <laughs> exactly. a call. Say, yeah, exactly. How are things going with you? How are things going to have a relationship that provides a context so that when you have the invasion of uh, Kuwait by Iraq, you can call these leaders and forge a coalition. The other deft sort of hardball uh, thing he did was when he was in China, he made sure he went, he and Barbara both went to every national day event <laughs> because, as he put it, we're the big guys, but everybody wants their moment in the sun. And so he made friends around the world yeah. just by showing up at the Australian Day or the Sri Lanka Day, whatever the hell it was. Difference. And he just, he was a master of what Franklin Roosevelt called the science of human relationships. Well, it's another interesting thing is the relationships he maintained with uh, reporters and columns who wrote about him. Some who wrote about him in very, un in, you know, yeah. very tough ways. I mean, it, like Maureen like Dowd, Maureen Dowd <laughs> like Anne Devoy, yeah, Devoy, yeah Devoy, even better. Uh, paper, our yeah. late colleague at yeah. Washington Post, right. who, um, you know, when she when she got cancer and and you know and, and terminal, but he he wrote. This, amazing letters to well, her. Once I interviewed him uh, while he was president, and I was working for Newsday and not that bright, and uh, it, I didn't do a very good interview. At the end of the interview, he said, I don't feel like I've given you anything. What, what can I say to help your story? <laughs> not, not really the traditional role presidents take. Right, wow, right. <laughs> the, other, the other thing you get, his, his humor, his humor was great in this. The day after he dropped out of the 80 race, he, they're living on Briar, Briar Lane, wasn't it, in uh, in Houston, and he lets Doug Geale from the mm -hmm. Times come in, mm -hmm. and he's there's a copy of the Yale Alumni Magazine and National Review sitting out, and he picks up National Review and says, "I guess we don't have to put this out anymore." <laughs> <laughs> so he knew he, he was in on the joke. You know? Well, during his one term as president, President Bush oversaw some of the defining moments, of course, of U.S. foreign policy in the 20th century, including the fall of the Soviet Union and the Gulf War, which he commanded, basically. His response was often refined, defined by as restraint. What a word we don't hear now. Here's how former President Obama described that. What people don't appreciate fully uh, even within his own party, is the degree to which he had to land the plane when the Berlin Wall comes down. You have chaos, potentially, in the former Soviet Union and Russia uh, and uncertainty in Europe. All those things could have gone haywire at any point. And uh, the, the restraint, the caution, the lack of spiking the football that uh, they showed uh, was, uh, I think, an enormous achievement. Isn't that something you're looking at the fall of those Eastern uh, European uh, dictators and they're taking the statue down? With Bush, they put the statue up. So interesting. Yeah. 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 It's, I'm sorry. Yes, you want more? Well, I mean, somebody, a president, has to offer to try to make the interview better. Um, it, it, it's, it's quite true. You know, um, uh, the restraint that he showed, he showed also when he left office, yeah. right? He didn't like everything Bill Clinton did as president. He didn't like everything Barack Obama did as president. And he kept his mouth shut because he thought that was not the appropriate role for him to take as president. That was true of his son, too. Oh, you're yeah, right. I was going to say, I'm not sure he liked everything he didn't like, his son did. He and Brent Stokroft were not big cheerleaders for that second <laughs> yeah. Iraq war because the second Iraq war was not a good one. The first one was okay. Thank you, Susan Page, John Meacham, who likes everything the Bushes do, mostly. Don't you? Thank you, Gene. Are you going to double now? Thinking about it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.